Welcome everyone. In this lesson, we're going to introduce the idea of antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. So really kind of synonyms. And specifically what we're going to see is we're going to see how to calculate the indefinite integral for our basic functions. And these are really functions that can be integrated using the sum, difference, or constant multiple rules. So we're going to learn some basic uh, integral rules here. And then we're going to have a list of elementary form antiderivatives to have memorized. And once we get into this lesson, it's going to feel very similar to what we did for when we first started introducing some of our derivative rules. There we, when we talked about, when we first started talking about derivatives, we had some basic rules that we introduced for how to handle addition, subtraction, and constant multiplication. And then we had a, a, a table. We had a list of some functions that we should know the ant, uh, derivative for. Same idea for this lesson on antiderivatives or integrals. We're going to learn some basic rules, and then we're just going to have a list of some basic antiderivatives that we need to have memorized. All right, so let's start. What is the, let's start with what it is when we talk about anti-differentiation. And sort of the, the question to get us started thinking about this is, let's say we only knew the derivative. So there was some unknown function and we only knew its derivative. Would it be possible to recover the original function? So specifically, let's say we there was some unknown function, we'll call it little f of x, and we only knew its derivative, we'll call that f prime of x. And so the question is, if we know this derivative, is it possible to recover the original function? And the answer, not entirely satisfying. The answer is, is sort of. We can do a pretty good job, but we can't do it completely normally. Um, we'll see why it, over the next few lessons, and we'll talk about it in a second. But what we're trying to do here is when we talk about anti-differentiation, we're talking about having some derivative and kind of working backwards. And so we call this process of starting with the derivative and trying to work backwards to find this original function, we call this process anti-differentiation. Or pretty much synonymous indefinite integration. Um, and what this is doing is it's kind of working backwards. So what we've seen so far in the course is how to differentiate. We've seen this process of differentiation. So we've learned all our derivative rules and, and all of that uh, for the Starting with function little f of x, we've seen all the all the work needed to calculate f prime of x. What we're going to be seeing in, in this new set of lessons is if we start over here, how do we work backwards to recover this original function? So there's going to be a whole bunch of new rules and, and things to memorize here. Um, and really the key here is to just think of anti-differentiation is sort of uh, the reverse process of differentiations. These are sort of reverse processes of each other. Um, and so if they're reverse processes, why is the answer sort of? Why can't we recover the original function completely? Um, in some cases we can, but it takes a little bit of additional information. And we'll see this over the next few lessons. Um, but the thing to keep in mind right now is when we differentiate, the differentiation process kind of destroys a little bit of information about the original function that anti-differentiation alone isn't going to be able to fully recover. So, you know, these are for the most part just opposite processes of each other. They kind of undo each other in some way. Um, but not quite because a little bit of information gets destroyed with this differentiation process. And so we can't completely recover that when we do the antiderivative. It takes a little bit more information. Um, so like I said, we'll see that over the next few lessons. Um, 
But let's start with the kind of the formal definition of antiderivative. So we say a function capital F is an antiderivative of a function little f if this relationship holds. The derivative of capital F is equal to little f. All right, so there's a lot of there's a lot of f's going on here. So let's let's think about what this definition is saying. So what this is really saying is we're kind of splitting these functions up into kind of two categories here. We have our antiderivative and then we have our derivative. And so we're saying capital F is an antiderivative of little f. And so the way we can check that capital F is an antiderivative for little f is by calculating the derivative. And so really calculating the derivative of capital F here is really giving us F prime. And so we're saying if we know, if we have this function little f, we call this function capital F its antiderivative if capital F prime is equal to little f. So we'll, we'll try an example, but let's just kind of take some time just to think about this because it is it is a little confusing because now we're kind of moving backwards we're kind of we're kind of starting with this function here little f of x and we're going to be trying to find the antiderivative in some way and so the this this definition gives us a way to to check we we think capital f is an antiderivative well how do we check it we differ we 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 actually differentiate this and so if, if capital F is the antiderivative, when we differentiate, we get capital F prime, and that should be equal to this function, little f of x. So we're kind of going back to our circle. You know, we're, we're interested in this term over here, and we're just kind of going around in a circle. And we hopefully get back to where we started. So let's, let's try an example here. We're going to say we have this function little f of x equal to x squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that the function 1 third x cubed is an antiderivative. So how do, how do we show something is an antiderivative? Well, we, we differentiate it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate, we're calling this 1 third x cubed function capital F of 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate. So let's differentiate our, our 1 third x cubed function. So let me write out that. And we'll show a little bit of work here, but we can probably just do this in one line. We're going to differentiate x cubed. 1 third is a constant multiple, so that goes in front. And then we can differentiate like usual. And we get 1 third times 3x squared, which ends up being x squared. And x squared is little f of x. So what we've shown is that starting with this function 1 third x cubed, starting with what we think is the antiderivative, if we differentiate it, we're getting x squared. So what we're doing is we're kind of, we're, we're checking in some way that 1 third x cubed is an antiderivative for x squared. And the way we check that is by differentiating. Um, now it turns out though, this is not a unique, having an antiderivative is, is, is not unique. So in part two here, we have this other function, 1 third x cubed plus one. Um, we're calling this capital F of two. And we're gonna show that this completely different function. These two functions here, 1 third x cubed and 1 third x cubed plus 1 are very different functions, but this is also an antiderivative for little f of x. And let's let's check that. So we're going to calculate the derivative of, of capital F of 2. So we're just going to go through and we're going to differentiate our function. 
So we just go term by term. That one third is a constant multiple, so we can put it up out in front. We'll differentiate the constant one. And when we do this, what do we get? We get one third times three x squared. Derivative of that plus one is zero. So we get x squared again, which is little f of x. So what we've just shown is that if we start with this function 1 3rd x cubed plus 1 and we differentiate it, we get x squared. So what we've just shown is that this function here, 1 3rd x cubed, and this function here, 1 3rd, oh, let's, let's highlight the... highlight in the, the text here. We've shown that both of these functions are antiderivatives of x squared. And so this property of having an antiderivative, the antiderivative is not going to be unique. So we make an important note here. A function f can have more than one antiderivative. So, you know, you could play this game, I could have put a plus two here or plus one million, and that would also be an antiderivative. So, um, if you just keep adding on constants, um, you get a brand new antiderivative each time, completely different from all the other ones. So in some way, this 1 3rd x cubed, that's kind of the, the key part of our antiderivative. And what we're seeing is we can throw on any constant that we want, and it, it's still going to be an antiderivative. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. Um, but what we're seeing here is maybe a little misleading. Um, so this is what we're doing here is kind of checking. We have a function and we're just checking that it's an antiderivative. When we get when we get really get started with the 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 main material in this lesson, what we're going to be doing is we're not going to have this function. We're not going to have one third x cubed to check. What we're going to do is we're going to really be starting with x squared and we're going to see how to work backwards. So right now, this is the, we're, we're, we're seeing the definition and we're checking that something's an antiderivative. But what we're going to be doing, this isn't normally how it works because this 1 3rd x cubed, we don't have that. What we're going to be doing is we're going to start with x squared and we're going to see how to work backwards. So we'll see that coming up over, over the, the next few uh, parts of this lesson. So we'll see you there.